Thank you very much for coming today to Norman Williams Public Library. Today we're very lucky to have Frank Gatto speak to us about Stephen Crane. And I'll tell you a little bit about Frank. He received his doctorate in American Literature from Duke University, taught at Union College for 33 years. And during that period, he was twice a Fulbright lecturer at the University of Uppsala in Sweden. One result of those awards after 17 years was The Passion of Ingmar Bergman, a groundbreaking study of the doleful imagination of a master filmmaker. Among Gatto's many other publications, his favorites are the introductions to Charles Brockton Brown's Ar Arthur Mervyn and to collections of the short stories of Sherwood Anderson and Stephen Crane. Most recently, Open Letters Monthly published Appearing as Poe's Father, a speculation on Poe's probable biological father. That was in August of 2012. Chapter 7 in the Cambridge History of American Poetry, and two books reappraising the achievement of William Cullen Bryant, An American Voice, and the complete stories of William Cullen Bryant. At present, Mr. Gatto resides in White River Junction, where he vows to begin writing his memoirs this year. Without further ado, Frank Gatto. Hold it, hold it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and, and for those who are interested, I'll uh, use this occasion to advertise the house, which is for sale in the White River Junction. It's a beautiful spot with great vistas at a very reasonable price. Okay, um, last time I was here, we talked about Herman Melville, certainly one of America's greatest writers, if not the greatest writer, uh, and a towering presence among American letters in the 19th century. Stephen Crane does not occupy that exalted position. I think in all fairness, one would have to describe him as a minor writer. Nevertheless, he is perhaps the most important minor writer in America's literary history, and he throws a longer shadow than perhaps anyone else, uh, not perhaps, than anyone else I can think of. He lived a very short life. He died at the age of 28, born in 1871. His best known novel, his uh, best known work is Red Badge of Courage, which is about the Civil War, placed in the Civil War, and it has led many people at first encountered it to think that he was a veteran of the Civil War. He was not. The war was over uh, by the time he was uh, born. Uh, but there's an interesting story about that, and I hope that I will get to it uh, during the course of the talk. He's a product of New Jersey, and uh, there aren't many of us who are products of New Jersey. Uh, we're quite a diverse bunch, and yet there is a common thread through all of us. Frank Sinatra, Bruce Springsteen, Springsteen, uh, various others. Um, uh, the man who did uh, The Sopranos, whose name, uh, uh, he changed it, that's why I've suppressed it. Um, uh, to be in New Jersey, to be born in New Jersey, is to have a, a strange upbringing because it is not quite New York City, which is the great metropolis across the river, uh, nor is it Philadelphia. It's a place. Uh, it's a place between major cities, and that's characterized it throughout its uh, its uh, its history. I think that inculcates in those who are born and raised in New Jersey a sense of being somewhat peripheral and perhaps uh, goads them because they're looked down upon by others as somehow second rate for, by virtue of being from New Jersey. New Jersey is known, I think, chiefly to people who were not born and raised there for the New Jersey Turnpike and to show you how New Jersey is so proud of its sons, although it gives us a rest area named after perhaps the worst poet who, uh, whose name has ever been remembered, Joyce Kilmer, who wrote Trees, it does not have a rest area named after Stephen Crane, who had very intimate connections with the state for a good part of his life. He dies at 28. His career really is about seven or eight years long. He did a remarkable number of things in that short time. And although I think it would be incorrect to say that without Stephen Crane, all sorts of things would not have occurred in American literary history, Nevertheless, it's quite obvious that he somehow, by being there and by writing what he wrote, 
did manage to focus in his work those developments which would come to, I'd say, dominate 20th century American and indeed world letters. Um, his, uh, his shadow is uh, very long. And the man who, with whom I think he should be most compared is a man who uh, looked upon him as a great uh, ancestor, as a great uh, forefather, as it were, uh, in, uh, in writing, and that was Ernest Hemingway. Their lives, careers, and temperaments are really very, very similar. Uh, and indeed, there's a lot of similarity in their, um, in their work. And fortuitously, or maybe not fortuitously, but uh, maybe it's just coincidentally, Stephen Crane knew, I'm uh, sorry, Ernest Hemingway knew, no, yeah, sorry. Stephen Crane knew Hemingway's mother uh, quite well during the time that he lived in New York and, and uh, she was uh, living uh, in the building of the Art Students Association or League or something of that sort. She was studying to be an opera singer. She had in mind a career at the Metropolitan. She did have a public concert in Madison Square Garden. Uh, and indeed, Crane makes her a principal character in one of his novels called The Third Violet. Uh, it's kind of interesting because this man who was very much a realist is most often criticized in that novel for not creating believable characters, for having characters who never lived. The irony is that it is perhaps his most autobiographical uh, uh, work with the most recognizable characters from his life. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, um, about his life. My coach, when I first sketched out what I was pro pro proposing to do today, and said I would start with a history of realism, said, oh no, uh, you should tell us, especially if there are women in the audience, you should tell us something about his life. And uh, uh, so I will do that to give you a sense of the man and the kind of work that he produced, which was very much a product of his life. His father and mother were both prominent figures, both in the church. They were Methodists. The Cranes uh, emigrated to the United States in the 17th century and uh, had some distinguished accomplishments to their credit. Uh, they were Methodists, and uh, Jonathan Crane, Stephen's father, um, wrote rather extensively and lectured extensively on theology, on the Methodist religion. If you know anything about Methodism, you know that it's, it, was, it was created in reaction to a church, the high church in England, which concentrated on the life hereafter and how to attain it. And the revolution that was Methodism was to concentrate on good works, to get into the slums, to get into the people who needed help, and to provide that help. And that even though Stephen Crane, early on in life, decided he was indifferent to the question of whether God existed or not, uh, nevertheless shows the influence of that thinking on the part of the Methodists and his parents, uh, given his, uh, his choices, and we'll get into that uh, a bit as we go on. Um, he was born in Newark, uh, and uh, not long after that, uh, the family moved to Port Jervis uh, in, uh, in New York, right on the border. Uh, border really where three states come together pretty closely, New York, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. Although I would say that most of his young life was concentrated in New Jersey. And there's a reason for that. His father was very much in demand uh, as uh, an authority. Uh, a man of, uh, who was very much looked up to when he died. Uh, there were oh, about 1,500 people came to his funeral, which was quite a large aggregation. His mother was very active, and again, this is interesting in terms of Stephen Crane's own life, in the Women's Christian Temperance Union. She had 14 pregnancies. Crane, Stephen Crane, was the youngest of those pregnancies, uh, of, those child, of those children born, and he was the ninth child. One could perhaps make a connection between that fecundity and the fact that, uh, that uh, uh, Mrs. Crane, uh, whose maiden name was Peck, uh, had mental problems and broke down. For that reason, she didn't have much of a role in the upbringing of her children. 
Stephen said that his mother was not nearly as narrow-minded as people assumed or as they said she was, but she certainly was no um, exponent of a libertine life. And one can, I think, fairly describe Stephen's life as uh, at least bohemian, if not outright libertine. Um, with that, many children and children who had problems of various sorts, alcoholism being one of them, uh, mental instability uh, being another. Uh, there were many deaths within a period of just a few months. Four members of his immediate family died. Um, so that, that uh, uh, you know, during the course of that, that period, Stephen was mostly looked after by his brothers and sisters, principally a sister named Agnes, and she died when, uh, when he was emerging from his teens. So he lived, he lived in close proximity to death and those questions about what the meaning of life might be. We know that from an early age, Stephen thought that he would not live long. And um, indeed, um, uh, he was sickly throughout his youth. He got tuberculosis very early on, and that's what eventually brought him down. He was not, uh, not a, a, a docile student, as one might expect. He uh, sort of liked to roam off on his own. He liked the outdoors. He liked camping. He liked being his own his own company, uh, and he was something of a hellraiser as a kid. He was sent to Pennington Academy, which his father had had a role in founding, uh, and uh, he did not distinguish himself in his studies there. So next he was sent as a kind of rescue operation to Claverack Military College, really more like a prep school, and uh, thought that he would be destined for a career in the army, since nothing else seemed to suit him. And as a man who liked history, uh, he liked to romanticize about the role that he might have in the creation of the history of his country as an army officer. But there was too much discipline for him if, to, to uh, warm to that role. And so he left Claverack, although he says that in, in retrospect, those were the happiest years of his life. Uh, but he did not know that at the time. There was some order. He didn't have to worry about where his next meal was coming from. Things were, and he also had some dignity and respect as an officer of the student, uh, student corps. Um, and that was something that he sought for the rest of his life, respectability, and something that, that continued to elude him over and over and over again. And as soon as, as he had won the kind of success that he thought he was due, uh, something would happen that would rob him of it, largely through his own doing. Um, so he leaves, he leaves Claverack, and he goes to Lafayette College in Pennsylvania. And his family has thought now that since he likes the outdoors, well, what would be better for him than a career as an outdoor engineer, that is, an engineer for mines? Well, the problem was he wasn't very good in math, and didn't have that kind of discipline. So after he was at Lafayette for a very short time, he realized that he was not going to be a mining engineer. His interest moved towards literature, clearly. Um, and it was the only class that he attended with any kind of regularity. Out of seven courses, he only, uh, he only attended four, uh, not a distinguished academic record. He did join a fraternity, Delta Upsilon, uh, and he found that a very congenial home. Another thing that distinguishes or that marks Crane's life is that he seeks out those situations in which there is something like a community, a home, a, a large family of which he can be a part, that he can play his role in it. And one sees that pattern really throughout his, um, his life. He starts writing there. Um, uh, with some regularity. His, uh, his uh, writing sort of resembles Mark Twain's. He also copies some of the things that uh, Edgar Allan Poe did. You can see him, he's feeling his way here, trying to discover what it is he wants to be as a writer. At any rate, Lafayette does not work out very well. One thing he discovers there is baseball. Not discovers, he had played baseball, but he loves the playing of the baseball. Uh, is a shortstop and catcher. 
and is pretty good at it. Even though he was sickly, uh, he had some athletic ability. So much so, in fact, that the Cincinnati Reds, the baseball club, tried to sign him to a contract. And he decided, after thinking about it for a while, that no, he was going to be a writer and not a baseball player. So uh, he has his, uh, his time at Lafayette, leaves Lafayette. He has, he has pull at Syracuse, where his family had had some ties, particularly his father, uh, and goes there, goes to live in the DU house, the Delta Upsilon house, and does not pay much attention, again, to his studies. He's, so his career at Syracuse is rather short. But while he's there, uh, he starts uh, uh, several manuscripts which indicate the direction in which he's going. He's clearly drawn to women. Uh, we don't know, you know, when he lost his virginity or, whether he, or when he threw it away, but we do know that, uh, that earlier with a classmate, I believe it was a Claverack who was having trouble relating to girls, he advised um, him to, uh, to seek help from a prostitute. And he said, and if uh, you know, bl black women are, are interesting, but if you go with a yellow woman, it would be even better, uh, and uh, she will sort of break you in. So it, if we can assume that he spoke from experience, uh, the attraction of the flesh uh, manifested itself rather early in his life. At any rate, he's at Syracuse. That doesn't work out very well. At this point, he says, to hell with education. I, uh, I'm going to be a writer, and the way to be a writer is to write. So he has a brother who is uh, head of an office of the Associated Press in Asbury Park, New, New Jersey, who is also uh, a, a correspondent or a, a writer for the New York Tribune, and uh, also uh, is the editor of a local Asbury Park newspaper. So. Uh, he starts submitting things to his brother, Townley, called by his middle name, Townsend, uh, abbreviation of his middle name. Uh, his first name was Jonathan. He was, had been named after his father. Anyway, so Stevie, as the family had known him, starts to work with Townley and starts writing just stuff for the paper. And Townley doesn't see any distinction really between one brother and the other. So these, these uh, short pieces are submitted as the work of the older brother rather than Stephen. But Stephen really likes this. Uh, his first piece that uh, really shows that he's thinking about what he wants to do as a writer and striking out a novel path for himself is Killing His Bear. And it's really a remarkable piece. Uh, especially for someone so early on, and it contains many of the essential elements that we'll see later on in his career. Uh, some years ago, I put together a collection of Stephen Crane's stories called Drawn from Life. What had happened was I was the editor of a college press, university press, and the man who had been tapped to do this work submitted something that I thought was an embarrassment, and so I refused to publish it. But the book had already been announced, so I did the work. And um, uh, the, the idea behind this collection of short stories, or a series of collections of short stories, was not necessarily to show the very best of that writer, but to show some sort of progression, to give a representative look at his career. And the first story in this collection is one that you, I don't think, will find anywhere else in any selection and it's called Killing His Bear, and we'll look at it later on. At any rate, and that is published in 1891. And in 1891 to 1892, uh, he establishes his own identity, uh, and he's no longer having his material published jointly with his brother, but he's using a, a byline. His first, his first experience of notoriety, and I'm using the word properly, notoriety, um, came when he wrote a piece on a parade of the, uh, uh, describing uh, the march by the, I gotta get this order right, the Junior Order of United American Mechanics. And uh, this was a parade, <laughs> parade in Asbury Park. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, what struck Crane was the contrast between the workers and the people along the side of the road. And the people along the side of the road were dressed in their holiday best and aprons and carried umbrellas. And the workers looked like workers. And they looked kind of scruffy and they didn't march in step and that sort of thing. And he described it because one of the things that he decided he wanted to do was to describe the world as it really was. And uh, this caused a great uproar because the junior order of United American Mechanics thought that they were being made fun of. That had not been Crane's intent, but that's the way it was seen. And it caused a kind of a national scandal because the, the uh, owner, uh, publisher of the New York Tribune was running for vice president on the Republican ticket. And so the Democrats held this up this piece uh, up as a sign of the disparagement of American labor by Whitlaw Reed, who was this publisher. Reed said, no, 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 he wasn't assigned to do this at all. Some, somebody wrote this in and there was somebody in the newsroom and didn't understand where it came from and it slipped by him, but this had nothing to do with me. Uh, but uh, a lot of people took umbrage at what he, uh, what had been, uh, what had been allowed to appear in the paper. And Crane, never, Stephen Crane, never wrote for the New York Tribune again. Uh, although the Tribune said he wasn't fired, it's very clear that he was fired. Okay, so what is Crane going to do? He moves over to, oh, I should mention one other thing before I have him moving over to New York City. Wh while he was in Asbury Park, he covered a series of lectures uh, summer Chautauquas, or I, I guess you would describe them as. And one of the featured uh, speakers was a man named Hamlin Garland. This, I don't know if that name rings any bells uh, with you. Uh, Garland is almost unknown now, unless you've taken courses in American literature that are rather uh, specific and go through the history of, of our country's literature, which almost never happens these days. Um, but Garland was a man of note. Early in the decade, in the 1890s, he had published a book called Maine Traveled Roads. And Maine Traveled Roads describes the hardship of being a farmer in what he called the Middle Border, or the Middle West as we commonly know it, and how those lives were very tough. Well, that kind of harsh portrait was not usual. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, he was uh, subject to a lot of criticism, that he was virtually un-American for pointing out uh, these uh, uh, kinds of dissatisfaction, particularly in the lives of women. But he defended himself, said, no, we have to tell the truth. And this was very much um, uh, Crane's credo as well. Now, when he went to cover Garland's lecture, he did not know because he hadn't really studied our literature very, you know, his time in, in uh, college courses was very short. And in fact, when he did take courses in English, most of that teaching was about the philology of the language. And so um, uh, he didn't know who Garland was. Uh, Garland had come down from a faculty position he'd held at Boston University. And so he referred to him in this article simply as the professor. He never uses his name. Uh, which is again indicative that he didn't know who this man was. Garland read this piece and loved it. Uh, it was about a, the most distinguished realist, um, a man named William Dean Howells, the, the dean of American letters at that point, good friend of Mark Twain's incidentally. And um, so the two men got together and they spent an afternoon together. And Stephen Crane taught Hamlin Garland how to throw a curveball. I mean, they really were on the same wavelength. And Garland would be Crane's champion, really for the rest of Crane's life. And so also would, would Howells. And at this point, uh, Crane sort of signs up for being a realistic writer, for showing our society, particularly in terms of its warts, in terms of its failures and not its successes. Um, he's drawn to that now. Maybe some of that reflects that Methodist background I spoke of earlier. But he becomes a champion of the downtrodden and sees uh, 
his duty as a writer to illuminate the difficult lives of working people. Um, so anyway, he and Garland become friends. Um, Crane starts writing short pieces, short stories that are published mainly in newspapers, to some extent in magazines. He's making a, a rude living up at it. He's also living, at this time he's moved to New York, he's also living with artists. And what is um, particularly uh, exciting in the world of art at this point is the Impressionist painters. And Americans are, uh, American painters are copying what they're seeing or hearing about from, from Europe. This new way of capturing reality. And Crane adopts that mode of writing, sees that as part of his obligations as a realist. And so uh, um, among the things he does is to go down into, because he's living in the Bowery, he goes down to the Bowery, um, and, and uh, trying to represent what that life is like. And one of his stories, which is not really fiction at all, but a report of what is really going on down there, is called Experiment in Misery. He dresses scruffily, which was not too much of a stretch for him, because he never was very well dressed. And he was also never very well nourished either. He used to get by on one meal a day to save money. He gets dressed rather scruffily and goes among the people in the Bowery. The t story is entitled Experiment in Misery. Uh, and it's a depiction of the life of somebody who doesn't have a place to sleep at night, somebody who can't find a place to wash. Uh, and uh, it, it, it opens some some eyes to the conditions in New York. Crane, um, Crane, in Crane's life we see lots of dichotomies, lots of, com lots of conflicts that he's drawn in two directions. In his own life he loves the outdoors, he's kind of a Boy Scout type, except he doesn't of course join the Boy Scouts or any other group, not, not one to, be, um, to join uh, well-structured organizations. Uh, he likes to camp, he likes, uh, likes to hunt and see those things. But on the other hand, he's also drawn to the complexity of society, the richness of society. He loves New York. Um, I just, I was reading about New York at this uh, point in history, in its history, just the other night. And uh, the author made the point that New York City, during this period that Crane lived there, had more Germans than the city of Hamburg. Um, more, um, uh, twice as many Irish as, um, uh, as Dublin, um, and um, let's see, what's the other, the other ethnic group? Uh, oh dear, I, I'm pulling a Governor Perry, I can't remember the third. Um, and and 330,000 Jews uh, living in the city. Now that, that's quite remarkable. Oh, the, the, the third group was the Italians. Ha, why did I forget <laughs> that? Um, and that, it, that there were actually more Italians in New York City than there were in Naples. So that, that this kind of richness, this, this array, this complexity was something that he was fascinated by. He was always fascinated by the workings of society and how these different levels related to each other. So he's there and he starts or it doesn't really start, he, he picks up on something he had started earlier at Syracuse. He writes about a woman and a woman's decline. That story is originally called Girl of the Streets. His brother, on reading a manuscript, said, well, why don't you give it a, the name of this girl, give her a name, and so he called it then Maggie, Girl of the Streets. And it's about a young woman who is innocent, in the full meaning of the word innocent, naive. She is seduced, and as a result then of the callousness of the man who seduces her, um, after she's pregnant, he has no use for her, she has nowhere to go. She goes to see a minister, a minister turns her away because he's, if, if she's too close to her, she'll contaminate his reputation and contaminate the church. You know, you don't want the church aiding the people who are, who are in bad shape, do we? Um, and so what we see is a steady progression downward, so that eventually she turns to prostitution. Uh, and even there, 
in her prostitution. And he does a, a remarkable thing in one of his chapters where he sort of compresses her whole career as a prostitute into one chapter where we see her uh, uh, consorting with men of uh, ever decreasing respectability and honor uh, until it's, you know, it's, it's pretty you know, desperate. She's, uh, she's um, prostituting herself for, for almost nothing. Uh, so that we, you know, we end with her, dis her destruction. It is a steady downward movement. He had great hopes for that as he, when he finishes the novel. He thinks that this is very much in the tradition of Hamlin Garland, that William Dean Howells will love it, as indeed he did. In fact, Howells championed him and said, ah, we have the arrival of a great new writer here. Um, uh, so what what Crane does when no publisher will touch it because of its subject matter, he decides he is going to publish it himself. He is going to pay for the publication and that way he'll get all the money himself and he will, all, it will also announce the arrival of a new kind of writer, a new force in American literature. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. He had 1,100 copies printed. He sold two. Um, and, uh, the, and even though he had some clever ways of trying to promote it, he hired four men to have hold copies in their hands and to read it on the uh, New York elevated trains. And he would have them sit one af after the other, so it would seem as though everybody was reading Maggie, Girl of the Streets. Uh, nobody did. He was very disappointed. He had published it anonymously, or anonymously, he'd used a pseudonym, Jonathan uh, no, I'm sorry, Johnson, Johnston, because he put a T in there, and that was incidentally a, a, a way of infusing his identity in there because when he was at Claverack, he adopted the middle initial T, which was not on his birth certificate. So here he takes a very common name. He picks the name Smith, which is the most common name, so that way he won't be traced. And he picks uh, Johnson as a first name, and he puts the T in Johnson, so it becomes Johnston. He figures that way that he'll be distinguished as a particular kind of Smith, and yet at the same time, his identity will be shielded. And then what will happen when everybody's talking about this book? He will step onto the stage, announce who he is, and he'll be a celebrity. Well, nobody gave a damn. Uh, and so the, it was a great disappointment to himself and also to his friends and followers, particularly his friends who were artists uh, and who were, um, who were very much his backers and saw in him uh, an important figure, not just in literature, but in the concept of what the arts should do in their relationship to society, to tell the truth, to expose the real nature of life. Okay, that doesn't work. He's, uh, uh, he's uh, rather chagrined about that. What am I going to do now? Uh, I, I've got to make it as a writer. He continues to write short pieces, which are published, and he gets $50, $25, uh, small amounts of money, enough so that he can just barely scrape by. It's at this point that he uh, decides, well, if they're not going to buy my books about current society. Let me see what is popular. And at that point, perhaps the best-selling magazine was Century Magazine, which was running, and, and this was also a period in which interest in the Civil War was perhaps greater than it ever had been. 30 years after, people are looking back in the Civil War with some nostalgia and so forth. And there's a series called uh, Battles and Leaders that is run in Century Magazine. And this is mostly a series of accounts by Civil War veterans about their experience in the war. And, but they're not writers. Uh, and Crane sees this and says, well, why, are, why is this so popular? Because nobody knows how these soldiers felt during the war. It's a description of their ammunition, description of the kinds of guns they used, names of battles, names of generals. I'm going to write about how the average soldier felt. And that's what makes his book, which later became Red Badge of Courage, quite distinctive. And he also applied a literary methodology, a, a way of approaching this, which was ex exemplary, exemplary of, the, of the, the new wave, this new realism uh, 
that was very much uh, in the air. Uh, in fact, this could be, this could be a, an account of a soldier in battle most anywhere. Uh, it is, of course, the Civil War, um, but he, he tries to universalize the experience rather than to particularize it uh, and give it a, an exact historical context. Well, he manages to finish it and to sell it to McClure's, a magazine, a publisher. But McClure's is, doesn't publish it right away. And Crane is just very, very eager to become that celebrity that he knows he should be. And so soon after giving it to him and, and in his impatient months go by, he says, I want my manuscript back. You people have not published it. You haven't given me an advance. They said, we can't give you an advance. We can't afford it at this point, but when we publish it, we'll give you the money. He said, that's not good enough for me. So he, anyway, he gets pissed off and he gets the manuscript back and now he's got to sell it to somebody else. Well, there's another syndicate called Bachelor, or run by a man named Irving Bachelor. And uh, he manages to sell it to Bachelor, who says, I'll run it right away. There's only one problem. That is, the manuscript is, contains roughly 55,000 words. Bachelor says, I will not run more than 18,000. And Crane is so eager to get the money, for one thing, so he can eat some real food, um, but also to uh, sort of announce his arrival on the scene that he says, okay. And so he cuts it to one third of its original size. Published in, the, in that form in newspapers, it does make a splash. People are now aware of Stephen Crane, and indeed some critics even go out of their way to say, hey, this is, this is the future. This is a major writer. This is someone who will uh, make American literature known throughout the world. Uh, very good prediction. And so on the strength of its appearance in that serialized form, Crane manages to sell it to Appleton, uh, a, a, a publisher. And uh, even there, it has to be cut somewhat. But that comes out, and suddenly, Crane is exactly as he had hoped and predicted, not just an American celebrity, but an international one. He makes a great splash in, in England, as well as in the United States, and uh, he is very much the principal writer, seen as the principal writer, perhaps not as established as William Dean Howells, who's been at, at this career for a while. But certainly, maybe he's a, at that point, he has eclipsed Hamlin Garland. He is the writer of the future. Okay, so he wants to capitalize on this, um, uh, does, uh, does Crane. And, um, and bring out another book, and also to, to get some more money. See, earlier, Crane had gotten into an argument with, uh, actually with one of, his, uh, one of his girlfriends, in which he said that the duty of a writer is not just to earn money and to entertain. That literature which lasts has got to tell the truth. And a writer has got to be willing to accept lower sales of his work for the sake of doing something that will live, that will live beyond this ephemeral moment of its publication. And yet, on the other hand, Crane is always trying to sell everything he has written for just a few bucks just to survive. He is constantly in arrears, constantly in debt, constantly feeling that pressure of having to produce something for money. So anyway, at this moment, uh, he has been sort of secretly writing poetry, although he doesn't want to call it poetry because somehow poets are of a different sort. They're divorced from life. You know, they go off and sniff flowers and write about them. And he wants to write about life as it is. He calls them lines, that he writes lines, not poetry. And um, he carries a pad around with him, and when a line comes into his mind, sometimes the, the whole, what we would call a poem, is done in two minutes, and he writes it down. At any rate, he collected these lines in a, uh, in a book called Black Riders. Now, just to give you a sense of what that poetry is like, I thought I would read two or three of, of these poems. Here's one. <clears throat> 
Um, Once I knew a fine song. It is true, believe me. It was all of birds, and I held them in a basket. When I opened the wicket, heavens, they all flew away. I cried, come back, little thoughts. But they only laughed. They flew on until they were as sand thrown between me and the sky. Here's another. If I should cast off this tattered coat and go free into the mighty sky, if I should find nothing there but a vast blue, echoless, ignorant, what then? Finally, and this is my favorite among all his poems, maybe it reveals something I don't want to reveal about myself, I don't know. In the desert I saw a creature, naked, bestial, who squatting upon the ground held his heart in his hands and ate of it. I said, is it good, friend? It is bitter, bitter, he answered. But I like it because it is bitter and because it is my heart. Well, he was, uh, he was very hopeful. In fact, at this point, he's actually daring to believe that he will be remembered in history as a poet instead of a, as a novelist. The reception of this collection of poems is somewhat mixed. As you've noticed, none of these poems rhyme, they don't have a regular meter. They're very, very revolutionary, much more revolutionary even than Emily Dickinson, who's not quite known at this point, um, much more revolutionary than Walt Whitman even. Uh, but there will be a group of poets who will look back to Crane's poetry as an inspiration, as a new break, as a, a, a new direction for, uh, for poetry. And indeed, that school of poets known as Imagists um, uh, recognized Crane in the next decade and two decades as a progenitor. Uh, he would later issue a second book of poems, which was far more poorly in, uh, received than the first. In fact, he was derided. And he said, you know, this is, this is just vomit. He just throws stuff out, and it all doesn't make any sense, and it's creepy. and and disgusting, and um, it's not at all what we are looking for in poetry. Okay, um, tr trying to capitalize on the success of Red Badge of Courage to make more money, he issues another novel, actually two more novels, one very autobiographical called George's Mother, uh, and it's really about the relationship between a dreamy child and his mother who was a leader of the Women's Christian Temperance Union which again is directly taken from his, from his life. And we have there a contrast, um, um, again, between uh, life as one would wish it to be and life as it really is. The second, I think, is of, although it's not as well written, but is of greater interest because, as I mentioned earlier, it has a very um, autobiographical um, aspect to it. It's called The Third Violet. And there again, we see um, Crane really torn between commercial writing, what one can, and this is an era indeed where writers who are successful are very, very well paid. Um, a writer that, whose name means nothing to us today, F. Marion Crawford, wrote dozens of books and they all sold like crazy. And uh, they all glamorize life. They all romanticize life. And what we see is realism on the part of people like Hamlin Garland, William Dean Howells, and principally Stephen Crane is exactly a reaction to that and saying, no, no, that is not what, you know, l literature should not be, a, should not be a, a narcotic, should not enable us to go on living in illusions, that we should look to literature to broaden our um, uh, knowledge of uh, reality. Okay, so very, uh, very successful Red Badge of Courage, not so successful to other novels. And this point, very well celebrated as for Red Badge, something happens that knocks him down as far as that novel had, had lifted him. And that is an encounter with some prostitutes that ruins his reputation. 
Crane is an idealist in the, in, in the way, even though he's writing about the, the slums and writing about the worst that can happen to human beings, what he really wants, of course, is to live in a good society, a just society above all. Well, he's doing research, roughly. Uh, I don't know if he's that objective about it, but about life in New York, particularly among prostitutes. Why is he drawn to that? And he sees two women uh, who are being accosted by a policeman, a guy named Becker. Um, and Becker is part of this movement in New York at the time to clean the city up, led above all by Theodore Roosevelt, who's police commissioner. And so Becker is, sees these prostitutes, knows that they're prostitutes, and accosts them. And Crane goes over and says, you know, they haven't done anything. And the cop says, I know these women. I know who they are. Uh, they, you know, they're just riffraff. They're, they're just uh, polluting our streets. And uh, the, the, one of the women says, no, I'm his wife. And Crane backs her up. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they are tried, and Crane goes to testify, and, and he, because at this point his reputation is still very good, he gets him off, right? And this really infuriates Teddy Roosevelt, who had been one of the great admirers of Crane as a result of Red Badge of Courage, you know? And they, they're very similar in, in loving the West and loving loving a life of action, and so forth and so forth. So, so Roosevelt is a fan. But when Crane pulls this, he feels that he's been betrayed. And they, the two become enemies, or at least Roosevelt becomes his sworn enemy. OK. Now, there's another woman who was with this. Not just the two, a third. And her name is Dora. Dora uh, Clark. And so Becker, when these two prostitutes, uh, and obviously prostitutes, get off, arrests this woman who comes in and tries to support their stories. Now his target is Dora Crane. Uh, Dora, I'm sorry, uh, Dora Clark. And Stephen Crane, feeling that this is an injustice, comes to her support. Not only that, but then Dora, feeling that, that she's being picked on, profiled, whatever, she sues the New York city police department, and particularly Officer Becker for defamation and so forth. Well, you know, what is the New York City Police Department, you know, New York's finest, what are they going to do? They have to defend themselves, right? But well, there's one big thing in their way, Stephen Crane, who says nothing happened. <laughs> These women were not doing anything. So the department decides that the way to counter this is to show that Crane is not a reliable witness, that he hangs out with prostitutes, that he takes drugs. And indeed, he, we have a picture of him smoking a hookah uh, in the Art Students uh, uh, League uh, uh, gathering place. Um, that he's, uh, you know, he's every kind of bad person. And they try to destroy his reputation. And given the nature of New York City newspapers at that time, they succeed. So, Going from the shining white hope of American literature, he crashes in the, in the most important city for literature and culture at this time in America, New York City. He crashes. He becomes scum. He becomes a dissolute wastrel, a man of no reputation, a man who will do anything for a buck, et cetera, et cetera. So Crane recognizes this. All right, what am I going to do? I got to get out of New York. Well, there's some trouble down in Cuba. There's always trouble in Cuba. And uh, the United States is casting the Southerners, of course, since before the Civil War, has been have been casting a covetous eye on Cuba because they figure they can turn these into slave states. That, after the war, that changes, of course. But, that, but there's a lot to be exploited in Cuba. Um, it's a source of sugar, and uh, that's a very much desired commodity. Uh, so it has, it has economic attraction. More than that, it's the last outpost of colonialism in the New World. And we've got to get rid of those damn Spaniards, who after all don't speak English, which is the language of God. We know that because if we read the Bible, right? And we know that that's written in English, and that's the word of God. So, um, so the, 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 there's a, a, an anti-imperialist fervor that builds. 
we've got to do something. We've got to help the revolutionaries in Cuba. Uh, and just as, you know, in the early days before the success of Castro, there was a great romantic interest in, in Castro and, and his Confederates in the mountains. Uh, so the same thing was going on at that time. And Americans are supplying arms to the rebels. So the newspaper says, we need somebody down there to give us the story. What's going on? And Crane signs on, goes down to Florida, down to Jacksonville, and, uh, and uh, arranges to be on board a ship which is going to bring ammunition and, am and, uh, and guns to Cuba. While he's there, he meets a woman named Cora, maiden name Cora Taylor, but at this point her name is Cora Stewart because she married a British uh, officer. And uh, she had some pretensions in, in, uh, in terms of society, and so she is known as Lady Stewart. And she likes to, to preen herself as being better than the, you know, than the average woman. But she's also a woman of some culture. She writes fairly well. She's interested in literature. She's interested in the arts. You know, she's somewhat tony for a woman who's been the mistress of two men and married twice. Crane thinks she's wonderful. They strike up a relationship of some sort, um, and then Crane ships out on the Commodore. Well, the Commodore is a sorry ship. It's not at all as seaworthy as it's professed to be, and it sinks. And on the basis of that, Crane and I think four, I think a total of four people in one of the, the lifeboats, um, spends 30, they spend 30 hours on the open sea, and then they make it to Florida. Well, there's a lot of interest in this, there's a lot of interest in what's going on with Cuba. Crane knows a good story when he sees it, and he writes it up, and that brings his stock way up again. The story is uh, known by virtually every literate American. Not only is it popular in New York, it's, it's popular across the country. And Crane is seen as a hero. Uh, and then later on reworks that account into perhaps his most famous short story called The Open Boat. Okay? So he's in Florida now and he has to recover from this ordeal. Uh, and he stays at the, well we could refer to it openly as a whorehouse, but, but, um, um, but uh, Cora Stewart or Cora Taylor, uh, given her, um, her snootiness, no, she doesn't want to call it that. It's called the Hotel de Dream, D-R-E-M-E. -E. And it's not quite as sleazy as it sounds because it was named that not as a kind of sexual fantasy, but because the previous person who owned it was named Dream, D-R-E-M-E. But nevertheless, it was a house of assignation, uh, and uh, it was a very popular spot. It was a high-toned whorehouse, uh, and Crane drawn to that element in society and having the combination now of, um, of sex and um, you know, satisfying the lower appetites, but also with a woman with whom he can converse, who knows literature, and who finds him very attractive, which is always the most uh, interesting thing uh, to him when a woman finds him attractive. And they get together and they decide that they are going to make a life of it together, uh, or at least she does, and they make arrangements to go to, to, um, to, uh, to England from Jacksonville, and then from England to take off the, and cover the Greco-Turkish War. Stephen Crane manages not only to get credentials for himself as a correspondent, but also to get credentials for Cora Taylor Stewart Crane, because they're pretending to be married as a correspondent. And she does indeed file some dispatches. She may be the first woman to be credentialed uh, as a correspondent. And as a result of that, they cover the, Crane sees his first battles, real battles up close, uh, and he writes about them, he writes some stories about it, principally one called um, uh, Death of the Child uh, and uh, their reputation as correspondents is, uh, is, uh, is burnished and once again his reputation uh, builds. But then they return to, they return to, uh, to England 
And uh, uh, they decide that because of the popularity of uh, Red Badge of Courage and his own popularity is so much greater in, in England than in the United States, principally in New York, where because of the animosity of the police department, uh, he cannot live. They decide they're going to settle down in a place called Ravenswood. It's not as nearly as elegant as the name they choose for the place would suggest, but it will do. Now, at this point, Crane's tuberculosis is pretty severe. And this is probably the worst place that they can, that they can find to live uh, because it's, uh, it's damp and it's slow. And, but it's got fascinating company. H.G. Wells is in the company. A lot of Fabian socialists are there. Um, they become part of this international set. Joseph Conrad becomes a, an intimate. Henry James lives there and is part of the circle. These people gather all the time. Uh, Harold Frederick, from, born in Utica, New York, who had a family back in, back in the United States, started another family while he's there. Uh, and he wrote some very good novels, principally Damnation of Thur and Ware. His reputation is not as high now as it used to be. But at any rate, he is part of that circle. And they gather and have parties and play games and talk about each other's work. And it's quite an invigorating in environment. Nevertheless, Crane tires of this life. And uh, he's eager for more action. And so, again, things are broiling around in Cuba. And he decides that he's going to go there and be a correspondent during the Spanish-American War. And he winds up in Havana. And from Havana goes then to when that battle is resolved rather quickly. And he tells the truth about what's happening and the, the, uh, the bad food that, uh, that the soldiers are being fed as a result of corrupt contracts with American provisors, uh, provisioners. Uh, and that, of course, makes them some enemies uh, in the, uh, the moneyed sectors of American society. But things quiet, and, and of course, Roosevelt is there with his rough riders. Roosevelt will not speak to Crane, although Crane is forced to write about Roosevelt. After a while, Crane goes to Puerto Rico, lives it up there, then goes back to Havana. Um, and all the while, Cora is back home, and the bills are piling up, and she doesn't know where her husband is. And she's, she's really fearful for his life. We, where is he? Who's he with? Meanwhile, he is having a gay old time down there in, among prostitutes, drinking it up with rum, you know, 60 cents for a gallon. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's very seldom in, in a position to think about what his, what his position is. Now, you know, one has to wonder about the nature of this relationship with Cora. Cora clearly loves Stephen. Stephen loves Cora, but only in a way. Stephen always wants to have a woman in his life. And yet at the same time, when he's with a woman, he feels hemmed in, enclosed, imprisoned. Um, in 1898, he, he proposes marriage to a, while he's with Cora, or while Cora is back home waiting. He proposes marriage to his first real girlfriend, um, who was a woman named Lily Brandon Monroe. She had been married at the time that he was you know, t taking up with her. And her family would have nothing to do with Stephen Crane as a prospective son-in-law. They quickly saw that this is a guy who's not going to have the kind of bourgeois life that they want their daughter to, uh, to engage in. So you know, they do everything they can to discourage this relationship. Lily understands this, they break apart, but he's still in love with her. He's got another woman he meets soon after named Krauss, Nellie Krauss, who's a debutante, who uh, uh, is from the upper levels of New York society. Uh, and he meets her at a party, and she has read one of his books. Well, at that point, she, he's smitten, and, uh, and he uh, talks to her, monopolizes her for four hours. Somehow, she managed, she doesn't get rid of him, and he continues to write to her for three months, ardent love letters. And then some, a couple of years later, he proposes to her while he's with Cora, uh, Cora Crane now, as a, she purports to be. So that there's this you know, interesting mix in his life. Um, he finally returns to, to England. His, his tuberculosis is in, 
you know, very bad shape. He understands that uh, he's not going to live very much longer. Uh, the bills are piling up. Cora is frantic, uh, wondering what she can do. Finally, she sends him off to, to the continent and to uh, a, a sanatorium, but it's too late, and he dies. Well, I've taken care of at least a rough overview of, of Crane's life. So let, let's, let's pause there, and next time, I'd like to talk about his work and, uh, and what, what he spearheads in the way of a kind of literary revolution. I'll talk about his, his role as a realist, his role as an impressionist, his role as a naturalist, and we'll look closely at, uh, at some, of the, some of the stories that are in this book. Okay, thank you for your patience. I'm sorry if I just went on too long, uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating life. It's a sad one in many ways, but uh, certainly an exciting one. He crammed a lot of living in those seven or eight years. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Frank.